Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. So recently somebody asked me what are the things that I wish I had known about sex and relationships when I was younger? And that got me thinking. For context, I grew up in a fairly open household. I got the absolute bare minimum, don't get pregnant, don't get STIs, sex education in school. And most of what I know about sex has either come through lived experience or learning very actively and intentionally as an adult. There was so much that I didn't know and that was actually one of the reasons why I started making sex and relationships videos on YouTube because I was 19 years old and learning all of this stuff for the first time and just thinking this is outrageous, more people need to know about this and so hence <laughs> 12 years later, here we are. So there are many, many things that I wish I'd known about sex and relationships when I was younger, sooner, like before the thing itself that happened affected me. You know, it would have been good to have had a heads up, to have known a bit beforehand. And I'm saying all that because I want to be purposely vague with age. This isn't a case of the things that I wish I'd known about sex when I was 15 or whatever arbitrary age we want to say. It's just, I wish I'd known it sooner. I wish I'd known it earlier than I ended up finding out about it. Before it became too late or the thing ended up harming me or what it meant was that there was an unlearning process that I had to do first before I could just learn. And that is just an ongoing process throughout our entire lives. It's not just something that you can like cleanly tick a box in adolescence and then be like, all right, you're good to go to have healthy sexual and romantic relationships with adults now, have fun. <laughs> anyway, all of that being said, here are some of the things that I wish that I had known about sex and relationships sooner. I've put them into categories and I also asked you guys on Instagram what are some of the things that you wish you'd known sooner and yeah, let's just dive into them, explore them a bit, figure out what is going on here and have a lovely little share and chat. <laughs> So my first category is pleasure and orgasms. Now part of me wants to say that I wish I'd known earlier that it was normal not to orgasm. However, I think I kind of did know that. There wasn't anything about my lack of orgasms as a teenager that felt wrong to me. And that's the part that I think I wish I had questioned or knew to question. And whilst it is completely normal, especially for people with vulvas to not experience orgasm, equally there can be a lot of reasons that can be addressed as to why you're not having orgasms. And I think often for women and people of marginalized genders, we kind of just accept our lack of pleasure as just like, Ah, uh, well, it's just normal, that's just the case. In the same way that we also accept a lot of pain in terms of like other areas of having a uterus, we're just like, eh, that's just part of it. A lack of pleasure and lots of pain. And I wish I'd understood that a bit more and I wish I'd kind of like fought for my own pleasure and my own orgasm earlier than I did. And I don't wanna say that in a way that is like, orgasm is like the be all and end all of sexual pleasure. It's it's kind of just symbolic of how I felt about pleasure and my own body at that time. And I wish I'd just questioned that like, maybe Hannah, you're not having orgasms because of the kind of sex that you're having. Have you ever thought about that? I had not. I wish I'd discovered masturbation earlier. Whilst at the time, I didn't feel like I was missing out. I didn't actually really take much of an interest in it, but that was definitely because I'd absorbed this idea that masturbating wasn't for girls. And I just wonder what the possibilities would have been had I been 13, 14 years old and wanking furiously. Like what would that have been like and how would that have like changed my experience of sex in my teen years and in my early 20s? All very much in a similar vein but I wish I knew that my pleasure was important and that I had agency in accessing pleasure. So fun little story here. I remember when I was a teenager and there was this guy that I really liked and he seemed to be interested in me 
two and we were chatting on MSN and doing the flirting and we like arranged a hookup and this hookup was going to be just hand stuff. So we arranged to wank each other off on MSN and have you ever heard of anything more naughties than that? <laughs> oh my god. But here's the thing, in preparation for said encounter, I put my fingers inside myself for the first time ever to have a feel for what I liked ahead of the experience so I could communicate it with him. No, no, no. I put my fingers inside my vagina to see what it would feel like for him. I actively remember this thought process that I had. Did I know about the clitoris? I don't know. I cannot remember when I first learned about the clitoris, but the clitoris definitely did not come into play in my prep for that encounter and the encounter itself. So I don't know what to say. My first masturbatory experience, if you could call it that, was to see what it would be like for a man rather than anything to do with my own pleasure. Ah, makes me sad for younger me. We got there eventually. And these are some of the things that you guys said about pleasure and orgasms. What masturbation was. Discovered it watching porn and thought no one else knew about it. This is a narrative that I've heard so many times where, yeah, you discover something about sex and you think it's this big secret because you've never heard anyone talk about it and you either think that nobody knows about it which is this case or there's the flip side of it where it's so obvious to you because you're like discovering your body and you're like oh wow okay this is cool and you just assume that also everybody else knows and everybody else does it but everyone's just not talking about it oh why don't we talk about these things that you don't have to know what you like slash dislike at the start yes oh my goodness I think I think as I've grown as well, this narrative of like, figure out what you like and dislike and then communicate that with a partner is starting to irritate me a little. Whilst it's definitely true, and that is a thing that can happen, a lot of our figuring out what we like and dislike happens from experience. And yeah, maybe that is by yourself, but that could also be with other people. And you don't have to have it all figured out, and you absolutely won't have it all figured out before you start having sexual experience. Experiences. Lube isn't just for old women and you won't always be super wet like media tells us we will. Yeah, this is one that I had to learn. I am someone who uses lube in pretty much all of my sexual encounters and I wish I had done it sooner. What squirting was, I thought I was incontinent until I watched your video on it. First off, I'm very glad that you ended up finding that video, but also, yeah, we're not given information about our bodies. And so we think that one thing that is happening is something completely different. Where my clit is, I hear you. I'm, I'm there with you. Like, I do not remember when I found this out, but I think it was too late. <laughs> My next category is just sex. <laughs> and for me, the thing that I wish I had learned sooner is, you know, just a totally vague, non-specific, general thing that could be applied to many, many people. Actually, I'm saying that sarcastically, but actually it could possibly be true that many of you will have also had this experience. But I wish that I had known that sex doesn't have to last for 40 minutes, and I'm talking P.I.V penis in vagina sex for 40 minutes and I don't have to just keep going until my partner orgasms. Oh, 17 year old me. And I also like made myself believe that I liked it because there were moments where I did like it and I was really into it, but just not for 40 minutes minutes and also it was just very much this idea really ingrained in me that sex ended when a man ejaculates. I didn't feel the confidence and I didn't have the knowledge to know that sex could just end when I wanted it to end or we could stop and I could wank him off. Like there are so many options where everyone can have like a good time and feel satisfied at the end of that and what I I did because I just didn't know and I thought that that was what having good sex and like being
being a good girlfriend was, just went along with it and said nothing. So these are some of your things that you said that you wish you'd known about sex. How playful it is and not as goal-oriented as I expected. I love that. Yes, yes, yes. This is gonna feel like a really weird moment to bring up my toddler, but being a parent and like watching him play and seeing how crucial play is for children in terms of relationships and learning and development and just how we have that beaten out of us by the time we become adults that play is like no longer important and people who are into BDSM will know this full well because BDSM is basically like adult play but there is definitely ways that we can bring that playful energy into any kind of sex that we're having and it's so important. Virginity is a construct and foreplay is a great main event. Oh my goodness yes. If I could tell you the amount of time and energy spent when I was a teenager constructing with my friends all of these lists, you know like the kissing scale and like Angus thongs, the lists were endless and the scales in terms of like specifics of what you could do, oh my god I'm getting like flashbacks, memory unlocked. We had this stage that was like there was a five and there was a 5.5 and it all there was initialism so there was like over bra fondly action, oh my god it was a whole code that we had, we were like oh did you do some boo -doo -doo -doo? wait over, over bra touchy action, <gasps> yes an under bra, oh my god, over bra touchy action, an under bra touchy action and so me and my friends would talk to each other like oh my god did you do some UTFA last night, <laughs> ah! But anyway, all that to say, yes, virginity is a construct and it is a completely misogynistic, patriarchal and heteronormative construct. And yeah, all of these scales of like the foreplay to the main event, like the UTFA or the OTFA, that can be the main event. And actually that very much was the main event when you're a teenager. And oh, maybe actually what I wish I'd known is that I can take that energy where making out for two hours was like the main event and actually bring that into my adult sex life. So actually there, there are things to be learned. There are things to be learned in all directions. That it might feel like everyone around you is having sex constantly. They're really not. Yes, I feel this. I think I might contribute to this as well slightly just because of how much I talk about sex publicly <laughs> and with my friends. But yeah, I think this is a really common feeling that people have in terms of it just often feels like sex is everywhere and this can be especially alienating to asexual folks. But generally sex is something that is so taboo and we we don't talk about at all or it gets really hyped up and over exaggerated and actually like people aren't having all of the like crazy sex that you think they might be having that you're comparing yourself to and I have definitely done my fair share of comparison to what I think other people are doing rather than like what I know they're actually doing. It's okay to never want to do a certain sex act and it's not your responsibility to help your partner explore. Yes, yeah there can be things that are on your like off limits like no absolutely not never won't do not interested in at all like you can have stuff on that list and that is absolutely valid and this point about it not being your responsibility to help your partner explore I think is a really important one but then we get into murky waters especially with how dominant monogamous culture is in our relationships, what if you want to do some exploring outside of the relationship? It's true that it's not your partner's responsibility but also your partner isn't entitled to be a part of all of your sexual exploration because that's personal and private and there are bits that you can share but there's also bits that you can keep to yourself. There's a lot there. Sex is sexy but not at all in the way you think it'll be based on movies. Yeah, I definitely find a lot of movie sex really hot but I don't think I've ever had sex like that and the sex that I have is also really hot. So yeah, there you go. Men only want one thing was more about manipulation and dishonesty etc than wanting sex. Yes, and this narrative of men only want one thing is something that I still encounter today among adults. It, it, it does not die. It will not die. Why won't this thing die? It does a disservice to men because they don't all want one thing. It's just incredibly reductive and if you think about the kind of message that that sends 
to men in terms of what they should want, how they should treat other people, and their entitlement to pleasure. And then also the messages that that might send to people that they are sleeping with, predominantly straight women, because this is usually like a very like heterosexual dynamic of like men only want one thing. It just does not set people up to have healthy, mutually respectful relationships or sexual encounters. That it takes so much practice. It took my partner and I a year to try and find what we both liked. Yes, practice, practice, practice. There is so much pressure to like be good in bed as if that is like a static thing and an achievement that you get and like you reach this point of like, okay, now I'm good in bed. I can say that I am a person who is good in bed. When that is just not the case at all, it is just constant practice and it will be different with different partners and that doesn't just go for sex, but when it comes to like talking about sex and communication, practice, 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 because you're gonna have to muddle through a lot of bad communicating before you start to feel comfortable and confident with it. Ooh, shagging around when I was younger was a lonely man's game. Yeah, so this reminds me of that research that was done where there were all of these reasons why people had sex. And yeah, sometimes the reason is like out of loneliness or out of boredom. And I think it's really important to recognize why we want to have sex, what it is that we want to get out of sex and not just like the surface level, but like what does sex actually mean to you? That sperm comes out of you again. So there was actually like three or four people that mentioned this and I just love how specific <laughs> it is. But yes, I don't remember when I was taught this, but yeah, if you're not using a condom and someone like comes inside you, gravity, that stuff doesn't stay up in there and get absorbed. <laughs> what fun. Not all women want big dicks. Not all men, not all women. There are so many messages that we receive around sex and desire that are just huge generalizations. And if you ever hear something that is like, men are like this, women are like this, this is what men like, this is what women like, just question it. Who's saying that to you? What did they believe about this thing? Why are they saying that? What's going on there? I wish I had been told about aftercare. It's so important. Yes. And this is something that, again, is actually a recent realization for me. I'd known about aftercare in a BDSM context, but only just recently started thinking about it in terms of vanilla sex as well and being like well actually yeah aftercare or whatever you want to call it just in terms of checking in after sex doing a bit of a debrief doing a bit of a review how was that for you kind of vibes building that in to actually it being part of the sex so important i don't even remember when i first started doing that but it was definitely like well into having sex and it also like wasn't every time or with every person <laughs> Okay, so my next category is reproduction and health. Now, this is the area that schools and parents, if they give you any information, this is usually it. This is usually what they are good at. But even then, there was so much that I ended up learning as an adult that I was like, what? Why was I not taught this? This surely should have been covered. This is very frustrating. One of those things was actually how fertility and the menstrual cycle works. You know, we were given the like, women bleed every 28 days for a few days and then that was kind of it. And I wish that there had been like a little bit more detail and granted like you can't go deep with teenagers and sex ed for everything. But one, my periods have never been 28 days and I just wish that there was an acknowledgement of the range of normal in terms of menstrual cycles. I wish I'd known that like tracking was something that you could do. I wish I'd known about ovulation and like when that occurs in the cycle. I wish I'd known anything about fertility. With it having taken Dan and I a year to conceive Rowan, I just wish that I had been prepped a bit more for that. It's like our whole sex education is geared up to like make sure we don't get pregnant and then the moment that we actually want to get pregnant, we're like, okay, how? How do we get pregnant? The other thing that I wish I'd known about when I was younger is reusable menstrual products. When I was a teenager, 
teenager and between the ages of 11 and 17 when I started my period and when I went on the pill which stopped my periods, I was using pads and tampons exclusively and I didn't learn about reusable pads, period underwear or menstrual cups until I was in my 20s and having periods again. Granted, they weren't really as around or as well known or as accessible or just existing, I don't know. <laughs> as they were when I was a teenager, but they were there because ask your grandparents, they were using cloth menstrual pads, they were using cloth nappies, and then it isn't until like the later 20th century that the disposable products all came into being. And so actually our grandparents were a hell of a lot more sustainable and reusable than we are now because the disposable stuff didn't exist. Anyway, I wish I'd just been able to like get on my menstrual cup and period underwear game much sooner. Sooner. These are some of the things that you guys had to say about reproduction and health. About UTIs, cystitis, thrush, and BV, which is bacterial vaginosis. Yeah, I don't know if any of that got taught in school. I don't remember it. It's definitely been something that I've just learned by experiencing them, going to the doctors, having friends who've had it, and talking about it with them. Not great. About sex negative things that are not true, like breaking the hymen and social stigmas. Yes, the hymen. I learned about actually what the hymen is and how it's a stretchy membrane from the internet when I was about 19 years old. Always pee after sex to prevent UTIs. I had so many before I found this out. Yes, this is a huge one. I think I learned this from my mum. I feel like this sounds like something that my mum would have told me when I was younger. But yes, so crucial and it doesn't really get covered in sex ed. It's definitely more of a like passing down from person to person in terms of like, oh, by the way, like, you know, everyone's like looking out for each other, like PF to sex, PF to sex. Here we go. That getting pregnant is actually hard. You get taught that every time you have sex, you will. Yes, so I remember learning that from one randomly timed act of penis and vagina sex, there is a 3% chance of getting pregnant. But no one's gonna tell that to a bunch of teenagers for fear that they're all gonna start having <laughs> unprotected sex and getting pregnant. But that's obviously just like one random time. If you're having like a lot more sex, then your chances increase. But I was honestly shocked when I found out that statistic, way lower than I was expecting. But then having now had tried to get pregnant and that'd be really difficult, I'm like, Oh yeah, we just never really got that lucky. What vaginismus was, because it was confusing when I had it, thought something was wrong with me, yes. That is ultimately what this comes down to with this like lack of information and wishing we'd known all these things earlier is because we think that there's something wrong with us when there isn't or that there is a name for the thing that we're experiencing and there is treatment available to us that can help. That vaginal discharge was a thing and that it changes. Yeah, I don't remember when I first learned about discharge and like the different changes that it goes through throughout the menstrual cycle. One, I wish I'd actually learned that in school and I wish it had been one of those classes where like it was every everyone so they don't like split up the boys and the girls because I want everyone to know about vaginal discharge. <laughs> Let's normalize vaginal discharge people. <laughs> And my next category is relationships. And for me, you know, as your resident cis, straight, monogamous woman in a relationship with a man, there are some things that I'd wish I'd known, especially when it came to like my dating years in my 20s and stuff. I just really wish I'd known it wasn't like the movies. I fantasized so much about all sorts of different like romantic encounters and like romantic things happening to me me. I just like got infatuated and fell head over heels for all these people and would be disappointed and really hurt when things like didn't play out the way that I wanted them to in my head based off romance in movies. And that's not necessarily those movies fault. Now I can thoroughly enjoy all of those movies. I love a good rom-com, a romance. I'm well into it. But as a young person navigating relationships relationships for the first time, not really knowing what love feels like and kind of like chasing this idea of it. What love ended up being for me was a lot more boring. <laughs> 
than what I thought it was. For me, being in a happy and healthy and stable relationship is just that, it's stable. And I was like very much seeking all of those ups and downs and the roller coaster ride and like the extreme highs and the extreme lows. And yeah, there is a time for that. And yeah, it was fun. And yeah, I got hurt. There definitely is this element of like, I just had to experience that and that's fine. But I do think knowing a bit more about myself and about relationships would have just like helped me manage my expectations a bit more. But here's what some of you guys said about relationships. Lots of sex doesn't mean a good relationship and not a lot doesn't mean a bad one. Yes, this is a myth that I definitely internalized in the early years of my relationship in terms of the symbol of sex and what it means and very much driven by these shoulds of like this is what your sex life should look like rather than actually thinking about what I want my sex life to look like and what that means for my relationship. Healthy conflict resolution, how to set standards and boundaries, basically everything. Yeah, I still am not great with conflict in most areas of my life, so I would love to learn conflict resolution. And I know that's like a whole field, like it's a whole thing. There's research, there are ways to learn how to do it and like understand conflict. Like, I wanna learn that. That should be a class in school, no? Ooh, that queer platonic relationships exist. Yes, just any kind of acknowledgement that relationships outside of the cis, het, sexual and romantic combined monogamous marriage-based relationships, like anything outside of that exists. You can create your own relationship. Do your own little choose your own adventure relationship with whatever works for you. So many things, bisexuality, proper consent, weaponized incompetence, non-monogamy. <sighs> oh my goodness, yes. Weaponized incompetence is one of those ones that I've just learned about in the last few years and I want everyone to know about it. It can be found in any relationship, but it's most commonly found in sexual romantic relationships between a man and a woman. And it is usually the man being bad at something so that he doesn't have to do it. And that is kind of like childcare or house chores or any kind of like running the home life admin kind of stuff. So that the incompetence in the area is weaponized against the woman so that she ends up doing the work anyway. If you've ever heard someone be like, oh, I'll just do it, they'll do it wrong anyway, they're a victim of weaponizing competence. That a partner is a friend too in the first place. You have to like them and enjoy spending time with them. Yes! I do sometimes find it really cheesy when people say, I get to marry my best friend. There's a little bit of like, oh, I personally feel about that, but it kind of is true. Like Dan is my best friend, but the core of this point about them being your friend and you liking them and you wanting to spend time with them is so crucial and I think especially in heterosexual dynamics because men and women are often like pitted against each other as opposites and as different and men and women can't be friends and so then if you're a straight woman or you're a straight man and you want to have romantic and sexual connections with somebody else but then you're also equally told that like mm, men and women can't be friends and like you are distinctly different from each other and there is like an element of like competition there, then how do you build a healthy relationship there if the underlying thing is you believe that you can't be friends? <laughs> That's just something I've been thinking about recently. <laughs> that monogamy isn't the only way. Yes, very much the case and very much not given to us as options, as a way of relating to each other as it should be. The difference between wanting to feel desired and desiring. Ooh, yes. That is something that you really have to like know about yourself and like do that reflecting of like, do I like this person? Do I like this dynamic, this relationship, this situation? Because I enjoy feeling desired or do I actually like it? them. Only you can figure that out for yourself. That it's okay to communicate directly rather than guessing all the time. Let's just do away with the mind games and pretending like we can read each other's minds and like you should have known. No. Let's just talk about it. Please. 
Okay, there we have it. Those are some of the things that I wish that I had known about sex and relationships sooner and some of the things that you wish that you had known about sex and relationships sooner. If you have any others that you want to add to this conversation, please leave them in the comments below. I'm really curious to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much to my patrons over at The Common Room for supporting this channel. And if you would like to get some behind the scenes content and access to our private Discord server, we are a lovely bunch of people and you're more than welcome to join and the link is in the description. Thank you for watching, hope you're doing well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye!